As we mentioned earlier in RDA, uh, James is not joining us today, um, and uh, Aaron Mendenhall is out of town uh, learning lots of stuff at Harvard, so um, that's a good thing. We're going to start immediately with um, item number one, which is our unresolved issues. We're going to start with Lehua and Jennifer, who are going to lead us through uh, just a few items that we have left to discuss. Council members, it's my hope we move through this pretty quickly. The staff um, needs direction on these few final items so that they can make sure it gets incorporated during our dinner break into the motions that we'll be adopting across the hall for our formal meeting. So that's uh, where we're going. Um, I'm hoping to move through it pretty quickly. Uh, there are a couple of items I think will require a little bit of conversation, um, so I want to focus on those. Primarily, I think the $380,000 that was recovered money from uh, this year's fund balance for the uh, unfilled positions of social workers. Um, we have a couple of proposals to look at for how that money could be spent, and we might want to consider giving some direction to the administration this, uh, uh, in this budget about uh, our priorities, so uh, who starts? I'll try. Okay. <laughs> um, basically, the way that the motions are set up is um, to walk the council through each of the items related to the budget. We've prepared those based on the council's discussions over the past few weeks, and we also have um, the key changes, which are the, all of the changes to the budget since last year, and those items um, that the council has discussed have been added to that worksheet as well. So we're keeping track of some of those back-end documents. The items that we have to go through with the council tonight um, the first item is about green team funding. It's an item that the council discussed last week. Um, and there are a few budget changes that might impact a willingness to reconsider funding that item. Um, the council had set aside $23,000 for increased training for officers who um, who interact with sexual assault victims. Um, the administration has since let us know that they've received a $70,000 grant that will do what the council was intending that funding to do. So the council may consider removing that $23,000 funding knowing that it's replaced with grant funding and then use that $23,000 towards green team funding and then pull another $102,000 from fund balance for the total $125,000 that the green team funding needed. And so, council members, I'll add um, that um, Council Member Mendenhall had some concerns about uh, this last week uh, in follow up conversations with her. Um, I believe she is supportive now of identifying some funding for the green team. We would be looking at $102,000 uh, from our fund balance to uh, fund this program. Are there objections or discussion concerning that? Can we give one more bit of information? Sure, please. There are a few other items that um, will be coming from fund balance, and this would, um, and based on the council's straw polls through last week, there was already $93,000 coming from fund balance, and this would be an additional 102, just for disclosure. Thank you. What is our current fund balance? So if, assuming the use of um, fund balance as outlined last week, so not including the 100,000, um, potential 100,000, you're at about 3.4 million above the 10% sort of general threshold, and that's before any other um, expenditure funds lapse to fund balance. So that's before any departments, you know, if they haven't spent their whole budgets, um, it lapses to fund balance. Typically, the city will lapse anywhere from one to two million. Um, obviously, if we're recapturing some of that savings for the social workers, that will decrease that amount. But um, I think you're in a, a decent spot you know, from a from a um, amount standpoint, you do have to kind of plan for um, future budget amendments that might come up through the year. But that seems like a you know a decent amount. Um, so, so uh, as uh, David Litback said a couple of weeks ago, this was just missed by the mayor's proposed budget. Um, so we, I, obviously, I don't think it's. A, I think next year for the green team, we'll probably see this in a department budget somewhere. And so I'm comfortable moving forward using $102,000 from the general fund or from the uh, fund balance to make this happen. Um, I can go into more depth and <laughs> make my pitch a little stronger if anybody has hesitation or reservation. Um, 
Anybody have any qu uh, questions for Council Member Kitchen? I think we can go ahead and start a poll. This are, are those who are in favor of including 102,000 from fund balance to fund the green team. Uh, thumbs up. Looks like we're good. We're unanimous. Thank you. Next item. Um, thank you. The next item that we had listed on your unresolved issues report is about Sugar House Fireworks. Um, and we have since learned that the chamber and the people organizing Sugar House Fireworks this year um, are not requesting any additional money from the city. And so the 15000 that the city has put towards the fireworks in the past remains in their annual um, allocation and they're moving forward with that. The next Mr. Chair, item. can I just oh, make sorry. a comment about that? Sure. Um, I, I spoke with the um, chair of the Sugar House Chamber um, on Sunday night and uh, they, they are looking forward and relying on that. They are the, absolutely the fireworks will go forward. Uh, they will, if they don't find a major corporate sponsor, they will take money from other areas of the chamber budget to fund it. But uh, then I heard from her early this morning that they think their major funding has been restored. So, but they still are relying on us for that and it is a great opportunity for our city to come together on the 4th of July. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Adams. So we will not need to include that item. Correct. Number three on the unresolved issues report is a question about whether the council would like to include a legislative intent that in the event air quality is poor around any city funded fireworks shows that the city would consider canceling those shows. And that's a, an intent that the council has adopted I believe two previous mm -hmm. years and so we just wanted to confirm that that's your expectation going forward. And that's on here because we really need to renew our intents every year if mm -hmm. we intend to intent them. Um, any questions, concerns? Uh, do, do I, have, I have a question. Do we run into problems with the state law? No, the state law is um, a limit on whether the city can cancel non-city Someone else's funded, someone fireworks. Someone else's fireworks okay. show. So that, is, that would be an update to the intent um, based on how it was written last year. This would be very specific to city funded fireworks shows. So even if there's a portion, a portion that is funded by the city, then we can pull the plug. So for example, Sugar House, the majority is being funded elsewhere. Is that, where would that fall? Would that be? I would, I, this, we can ask the attorneys. My guess is that as just a minority contributor, we couldn't control whether they had their firework show. Okay, so it, just where, where we are the majority funder. I don't is, know if you could even parse it that thin. I would okay. think if, if the city is entirely Sponsoring funding it. maybe, and the attorney's office can tell us. But, okay. But telling other groups what they can and can't do probably wouldn't go well. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. So let's uh, straw poll that. Are you comfortable going forward with that similar intent next year? Thumbs up. Looks like we're all unanimous on that. Okay. Um, the next item is... Before we go to the next one, because I think it'll take the most discussion, can we cover those uh, items five and... S and sure. actually, we're, we're five and six. Six, we're probably not... Based on our uh, right. RDA conversation, I think we're... Con Drop we six, that, right. um, uh, but the Arts Council, um, they're, they're well. Go ahead, Lehua. <laughs> Um, the Arts Council, it's come to staff's attention that their ongoing budget will not cover their expenses this year, but we don't have full and complete information to have um, more of a budget discussion about that. Um, and so we want to disclose that to the council. I believe Arts Council staff is here if the council would like to ask any questions. Um, but at this Mike Reberg is sitting literally on the edge of his seat. <laughs> so I'd invite Mike to come up and just reference that. Um, and, I, I, and I remind the, um, the council that we have committed to scheduling a very extensive conversation, in particular around the Twilight series uh, this fall uh, after the series is over this year because the Arts Council is committed to do a lot of data collection and analysis as part of this year's concert series. Mike. Thank you very much, Council. Um, at this time, uh, we do not want to seek the additional funding. So we, we, we can just pass on that. 
we agree that we need to do a business analysis of the Arts Council in Twilight and finish the study. So at this point in time, we would, we do not seek the additional funding. Any questions? Comments? Okay. I think we're good. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Uh, item number uh, four. Or do you, there were some new items that we passed out in your red folders. Do you want me to go through those? I'm sure. Go so ahead. Quickly? Yes, please. Yes, okay. yes let's go ahead. So, I, want, I do want to save number four for the last. So. In your red folders um, is some purple, are some purple copies. And one of those is an updated unresolved issues report. And that's what I'm referring to. Number seven is just also to bring information back to the council. Based on a re recent constituent email about a tree removal in Liberty Park, we learned that the amount the council has straw polled adding to urban forestry uh, would not cover 100% replacement of the number of trees expected to be removed this year. Um, there might be a need for further council conversation at a later time about whether um, to fund more maintenance so that mature trees are preserved, whether there's a staffing component to what's needed. Um, but for now, what the, the budget as straw hold includes is $75,000. That would increase the number of trees that the administration is able to replace this year. And they um, maybe could come back with a report on how that's going in a mid-year briefing. So, council members, I'll just to jump in and suggest, because uh, I was um, supportive of this last week, that my intent was to get the funding back to the same level, acknowledging that it may not be the same number of trees <laughs> just because of cost, but I'm okay right. going forward with this. Any questions or concerns about this? And, and um, one of the items I want to capture, Lehu, is, is the capacity of the current staff to maintain. As mm -hmm. we continue to increase the number of trees we're planting or removing, I do have some concerns that we don't shortchange the staff and their ability to keep up with that. Sure. Um, number eight is an intent statement that the council might consider related to the RDA finance position. The council straw polled placing that position in the finance department and this would be an intent statement requesting that the administration provide monthly financial reports on RDA expenditures and that um, a mid-year briefing would be scheduled to go over those as well. This is also consistent with the motions the council made as the RDA board. So if there's no objections, we'll add that to the legislative intent. Any objections? Okay, we're good. The last item is also just um, a note for the council that the consolidated fee schedule as um, provided in your packets includes uh, the new golf fees. However, um, we accidentally did not um, include an ordinance that lays the framework for those fees. And so the ordinance would be provided for the council's consideration on July 12th. Um, the question is whether you want to approve the consolidated fee schedule with those fees added, knowing that the ordinance, the corresponding ordinance will be considered on July 12th, or whether you want to pull those fees out until the ordinance is considered on the 12th. And it's actually just a minor t clarification. It's not all the golf fees. It's the it's there's two new fees that establish an annual pass for um, one annual pass is for Glendale and Rose Park, and another annual pass is for Nibley and Forestdale. So because they're new fees, an ordinance is needed to create a framework or uh, you know uh, how those fees can be charged essentially. Um, but it, because it's a 12-day period, we didn't necessarily think it was worth pulling them out um, if we're just immediately following up with an ordinance, but wanted to make sure that the council was aware. And the final point is that the administration <coughs> has um, spent a lot of effort on the projections for the uh, num golf rounds. And so if we were to hold that back, uh, it could impede the um, progress that they hope to make. So, council members, do you have any objection to moving forward as uh, is currently proposed with the understanding that there will be 12 days <laughs> when, <laughs> before the ordinance is adopted in the new fiscal year? Uh, is that a problem? Does that give anybody any grief? Looks like we're okay. Great. Okay. So Tee it up. 
tee, tee it up. There are a few other purple copies in your red folders, and those relate to the $380,000. One proposal is uh, from was provided by the Downtown Alliance, and they have a suggested use of those $380,000. And then another, at the back of that, it's a stapled packet. The last page of that is a proposal, a recommendation from the mayor's office on how that $380,000 could be spent. So council members, we have a couple of options here and I'm going to defer to anyone who wants to make a case for a priority. Uh, if we do nothing, uh, we are sending the message to the administration to go forward with their recommendation basically. Mm -hmm. um, we can uh, look at actually allocating the dollars and so if you have something that you want to propose uh, receives a dollar amount allocation of this 380 now's the time to make that proposal or we could actually just come up with a list of priorities of things that we feel are important uh, to fund and we could forward those to the administration and say with the money available figure out how to fund these and these priorities and David do you have anything to add uh, thank you council members uh, Penfold no I was just going to come up and answer any questions. Um, the only thing I would add is the recommendations that uh, were put forward uh, by the administration um, is the, the product of a lot of work internally with CED, Salt Lake City Police Department, <coughs> Public Services, our, the Mayor's Office, as well as uh, work with the provider community on addressing both short-term uh, mitigation needs in the Rio Grande neighborhood, but also with a look towards what we want our system to um, to look like in the future. Great, thank you. You're welcome. I'm and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. So anyone, if you have questions, uh, direct them to David. Derek, do you have comments or? Yeah, I, I don't have com I don't have a question for you yet, but maybe. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I really want to support the administration in all of this, in this uh, proposal that we received. Um, but I also have a few ideas of my own. Um, you know, I, I, for me, the money here ought to go to public health and uh, public safety. And I, you know, I see a lot of that here with the $100,000 proposed for uh, increased foot patrol, which I would support. Um, you know, I'm looking at this Fifth West uh, mitigation, uh, $50,000 proposed. Um, it. I guess just re reading this um, cursorarily, it, it seems like maybe that might need to be developed a little bit more. I'm not entirely sure what that will go toward, but um, my feeling is that maybe we should direct that toward the uh, clean team that is currently a very successful job training program uh, for homeless individuals, and that could help us keep the Fifth West median in particular clean, and um, you know whether that's cleaning up after you know human waste or uh, just trash that people leave from camping on the 5th West Median. I'm not entirely sure, but I'd love to maybe have a conversation right now with the five, uh, you know, among the five of us about how we might want to direct that, that money. So if you have any ideas, Andrew, I know we talked about this a little bit. Other, sure. other thoughts about? Well, I think, and I'll let David answer this, but I think one of the intentions was to see if people would migrate off of 5th West to a place that's um, cooler in the summertime so that you can actually clean the clean the medians. Um, that, at least in my view, that's where that came from in me, I don't know, David? Correct, so one of the ideas that we're exploring on the 500 West uh, mitigation is a temporary day shelter that would provide relief of the median a couple of days a week, is what we're hoping, where we would set up a temporary um, spot where there would be shade cover, there would be providers there, there would be services, possibly food, uh, and encourage uh, individuals experiencing homelessness to spend some time there and provide some of that immediate relief on, on the median. Uh, we've also um, have been, uh, we are convening uh, a, a meeting with some of the community members in um, right on 500 West to talk through some of the ideas they have on how we can mitigate 500 West. Uh, and we've also finalized a survey uh, of individuals, hand, uh, handed, yes, um, a survey of individuals on 500 West to try and learn some more information on what would encourage individuals to access services in other areas. Um, 
On this uh, potential improvements to Rio Grande area list that uh, you gave, I think, last week, um, you know, bullet point number two was to create a 24 presence, 24 7 presence on Fifth West with a combination of private security, outreach workers, and downtown alliance ambassadors, such as the clean team. Um, you know, I just did a little bit of math really quickly, and if we were to f- put money toward uh, the clean team eight hours a day, five days a week for a year, that would if I did this correctly, it would be about $23,000, 23, $23,000 in additional funding? Yeah, in funding for eight hours a day, five days a week. Um, and so, you know, I would like to see that maybe funded, and maybe we could outline that in this funding and then leave some of the the funds as discretionary for the administration and they can do whatever they want. But, you know, in addition to the police foot, pat- foot patrol, I would like to maybe see some... Uh, cleanliness, and I see the clean team as maybe one way of going about that. So I would propose that we do, a, you know, at least a hundred thousand dollars, or you know, what the administration proposed here for the foot patrol, and then 25k, uh, you know, toward the the the, uh, the clean team, and then. Okay, so this uh, process will look very similar to the CDBG process, which is if you're going to suggest new money, you have to identify where it comes from. <laughs> so if com- you're if you're looking at uh, uh, if you're looking at primarily the, the mayor's uh, administrative recommendation for uh, how to move forward, um, we'd need to have a conversation, uh, Derek, about where you would suggest that uh, funding. Can I can I interrupt yes, for a second? Yes, please. Um, Talk about the, the interface between the fifth and west mitigation, the enhanced day services, and the queuing. Um, do you have specific ideas in each of those that we haven't talked about? Yeah. With the, specifically yes. the day services. So the the let me start with the queuing. Okay. Um, the queuing is actually uh, a byproduct of the conversation that uh, Council Member Kitchen and, and Johnston. I almost called you Mendenhall. Um, <laughs> Rock Aaron's line. nameplate is in front of you. <laughs> yeah, that's why. <laughs> and, uh, and the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> you both look short. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the mayor had. I apologize um, to Councilman Mendenhall. <laughs> <laughs> um, with, with the road home and the discussion about the queuing and utilizing one. Be, right now, there are about 15 to 20 families currently in the road home. And so the road home has some flexibility with one of the uh, outdoor playground areas to utilize that space. Uh, for the um, time between um, the, uh, when individuals are asked to leave and they clean, which results in the queuing and the lining up for access back. And so utilizing that space where the playground is to um, mitigate the queuing so that we would not have queuing. What they are requesting is, because this is a pilot um, and because the 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 family shelter being year rounds is a brand new thing. They don't want to remove the playground at this point. And what they would like to do is fence off the playground um, to protect it. And, um, and so that's what our $10,000 would be um, allocated for is to help the road home fence off the playground in that area so that it could be used to avoid queuing. Um, the $25,000 towards enhanced day services is connected to the 500 West mitigation in that we look at that as, um, so last year the, the administration and the council funded um, additional uh, day services at the Wiegand Center that allows them to stay open on the weekends. Um, initially it was intended to expand weekday hours but then was shifted to, to weekend hours. This funding would be used to extend weekday hours. The reason why it's a little vague right here is we want to work with the Wiegand Center. We, it's, to, to us it's not just a matter of saying we have extended hours. We want to work with the Wiegan Center on strategies that they're going to employ to engage more individuals to utilize the expanded hours. Um, we think that would have some impact on the 500 West, um, mitig- uh, 500 West as well in terms of expanding uh, the availability of services during the day, at least expanding the, the hours. Well, I. I see what you're saying as far as comparing this to the CDBG process, um, Mr. Penfold, but um, I have two proposals here, one from the Downtown Alliance and one from the administration, and I think they both have their uh, merits. Um, One thing that I do like about what the Downtown Alliance proposed is this educational campaign. 
um, that they said that they could find uh, up to a hundred thousand dollar match on that as well, which I think could. Be we great. would be more than happy to work with them um, and look in at that as one of the ideas or the concepts for the 500 West uh, mitigation. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have their proposal. So I'm just no, that's okay. You can have and, mine. And if I can say, Councilman uh, Penfold, what I oh, thank you. Um, what I heard Councilman Kitchen suggesting was maybe that the 23,000 or 25,000. Um, as a part of the 500 West mitigation from the 50 be used specifically for the clean team of the 500 West area. Is that, yeah. did I hear that correctly? I just think we get more bang for our buck with the clean team because it's job training and they end up, the people that we employ end up being more stable in the long run anyway. Um, so I think it's a great program, so I'd love to support them even further, but um, yeah. Are there other items from either one or um, e either the administrative proposal or the downtown lines proposal people want additional information on or want to discuss? How, how does the, um, the education campaign match up with the collective impact uh, agenda? Because they have some ideas in there about doing outreach on panhandling specifically. Is that too far off in the future to even touch at this point? No, uh, the administration, our administration is working closely with the downtown alliance, Visit Salt Lake, specifically on a panhandling um, campaign, um, not necessarily connected to collective impact. Uh, I think the educational campaign that they're speaking about um, <coughs> It's, it has some similarities to the panhandling. I'm not familiar enough with the messaging that's revolving around the panhandling, whether that can be incorporated. It may possibly be able to, but I wouldn't be able to give great insight on that. Mm -hmm. um, but something that we can definitely follow up on and see if that can be incorporated. I think they are pretty close on that. Mr. Chair, can I um, put in two cents on this? Please. Um, I think. I would guess that they're thinking a little bit along line, the lines of something we saw on the trip to San Francisco, which was where you could go online and you could um, donate and then you were gi given a card that had a value on it and instead of giving money to someone, you would give this card and they could present it to get food, clothing, various other things. So it um, did not have value at the liquor store or as a drug deal particularly, but it would have value at, for example, the DI or at um, some place to get a, additional kind of food. And if someone just chucked it because they didn't want it, the money is still secure in the foundation or whatever that is taking care of that. And I think we've learned that um, we have so many really good-hearted people in our city that it's hard for people to walk by and not want to do something, whether someone's panhandling or not, just somebody who's on the street. And I was really intrigued with that idea and the possibility of having that be an appropriate response to how to do it. And so I think maybe they're thinking along those kinds of lines to do something definitely, with that. Definitely follow up with them. I have one other question. Um, on your proposal, the increased capacity for a place for your stuff, yes. do you have ideas on how you might roll that out even broader? Because my understanding is that the current SDI warehouse that it's, that it's used for this is at its capacity. Yeah, so we are, so there's two, two issues. One, the bins themselves are at capacity. And so um, in terms of the current funding, we are at capacity for um, the bins for individuals to use and have a need for many more. Um, and then there's also the issue of identifying the additional space. And so we're actually looking for additional space in terms of warehouses, but we're also looking at kind of those temporary structures that would allow us to accomplish the same goal. So this is, this is also a, a really important initiative in the sense that, um, one, it addresses some of the camping type of issues, right, in terms of giving in individuals experiencing homelessness an oper a place to keep their stuff, not to have to worry about uh, it being stolen, um, congregating it in, in, in on 500 West, things like that. But it's also been found that um, it has become a, a real important support service for individuals to access employment training, other types of programs and services that they're not worrying, if they're not, you know, worried about protecting the possessions that they have, they're able to, to access other types of services mm -hmm. that they need. And so we see this as uh, both one of those proposals that 
help us mitigate the short-term needs in the area and for the individuals, but also moves us in, in the right direction uh, for the future. Yeah, it's been very successful in my very opinion. Very successful. David, um, yes, you've listed um, $150,000 for a pilot project with yes. Salt Lake County Behavioral Health Science uh, Services. The Downtown Alliance suggested some funding, about $120,000 for detox uh, to buy up some bed space. Um, can you just explain uh, how you imagine the pilot project and would it help address some of those um, detox issues? Yes. So this one I'm actually really excited about and, uh, and I know that Salt Lake County Behavioral Health Services Director uh, Tim Whalen is really excited about. Um, this, is, this, is, this is one of, uh, has the potential of being um, an initiative that really leverages the work that we're doing with the social workers and trying to connect with individuals experiencing homelessness in a different way, but also allow us to enhance services on the back end, which I think is one of our biggest gaps, right? We all know it's one of our biggest gaps. The, the current vision around uh, this pilot project would be to utilize the community connection center, that when individuals are connecting with our social workers, they would be assessed for behavioral health needs, substance abuse addiction, uh, mental health, um, housing stability. And for those, some we will find, particularly with uh, severe and persistent mental illness, will be eligible for Medicaid. So we will be able to utilize that connection right there to access Medicaid to get into critical services. The, cur the funding that we would be able to and possibly, uh, hopefully, I don't want to say match, but shared with, with the county, additional funding for those that are not Medicaid eligible would actually be used to create some priority, um, uh, priority slot in the behavioral health treatment system. So individuals would be able to immediately access treatment, whether that be detox right into substance abuse uh, treatment beds. And so that would, this would give us an opportunity to prioritize um, again, treatment for individuals connecting through the Community Connection Center. Uh, it, is, it is the type of thing that we need to move towards uh, in serving our homeless. It is very, uh, I think, consistent with collective impact um, and uh, the ideas and the concepts coming out of, out of collective impact, both in terms of stronger assessments uh, and immediate connection to critical services. Thanks, David. Uh, any additional questions? I have a possible proposal. Lisa. Um, just uh, one thing that I know uh, the Crossroads Urban Center last year made the suggestion that we consider closing Rio Grande and uh, so that we could contain people more easily in one area and control who comes in and who comes out um, and making that something that would work. I, I know um, you and I offline discuss that, but I wondered if you'd like to talk a little bit about sure. that, because to me that seems like um, that could maybe be a, a temporary workable way to, to deal with the problem. So one of the, um, so our internal uh, coordinating team that meets on a weekly basis, again, CED, public services, uh, PD, mayor's office, uh, public utilities, um, have really ex explored this concept. And one of, one of the concerns that, that has come up is in order to to make um, close, the closure of Rio Grande um, work is you would have to, in essence, you would have to privatize that street. You need a mechanism whereby you can create rules, uh, just like the Wiegand Center. So the Wiegand Center as a private service provider and a private property owner has certain rules that individuals engaging in their programs and engaging in their services have to follow. And if they will not follow the rules, then they have the authority to ask individuals to leave. It's the same concept with Rio Grande. And so we're not, one, we're not sure whether we have the authority or how we would privatize that street in order to control We have a access. bunch of good lawyers. <laughs> we do. And we, ha and we haven't explored it probably well enough with the lawyers. But that's one of the concerns that we really kicked around um, in terms of that ability to control that access, uh, create rules, and enforce that. And so. Uh, we weren't sure. Uh, we were also a little uncertain in terms of the type of impact that would have, and so right. we did not forward that to the mayor uh, as a recommendation at this time. Council members, we're um, severely out of time. Uh, let me make a suggestion that we move forward with the administrative recommendations with an additional $25,000 for the clean team from Fund Balance. 
um, that should get both of the all of the priorities that I've heard us discussing. I see nodding heads. Let's do a straw poll. Are you can, okay? Can I just throw one thing in though? First, yes. I know we're short on time. Um, one thing I really would like to see is a way that we guarantee a bed to someone who's gone to a job that you should not lose your opportunity to stay at the road home because you went and worked. And I, I think we really need to address that. Absolutely. Because we're, if we're trying to get people to move on and to do that, and I want to continue to explore the pop-up idea of twice a week on Fifth West, I think that's um, an intriguing possibility because it's on property we own. Right. And so we could maybe control it a little bit better and drop people off of Rio Grande Great. and in a more positive way on Fifth West. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So we're going to straw poll those in favor of moving forward with the administrative recommendations and an additional $25,000 from fund balance to uh, provide more capacity with the clean team. Thumbs up if you support that. Thumbs down if you don't. Looks like we're good. All right. I think that's all our unresolved thank issues. Thank you so much for your hard work on this council staff. And thank you, administration, for the recommendations. You're very welcome. We're going to move really quickly to our board um, appointment interviews because those were time certain for a while ago. Um, so I'm going to uh, combine a couple of these. Um, Karen Gunn and Susan Rice are both up for uh, appointment to the Biz Business Advisory Board. Could you join us? up here at the table with a microphone and um, I will ask you uh, to act like you're either doing karaoke or that you're a rock star because you have to pull that microphone really close uh, so that we can all hear you and could you each quickly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your interest in the business advisory board. Thank you, Mr. Chair and City Council. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Karen Gunn. Currently, I'm the Principal Strategy Consultant for Gunn Consulting Cooperative uh, here in Salt Lake City. I am a partner in a group that runs small business, economic development, and workforce development projects in Phoenix, Knoxville, uh, Long Beach, and uh, Salt Lake City. And we have projects that run from uh, large association projects through small business. So I promised myself that some time in my life I would give back to Salt Lake City in some way for the opportunity to have a 30-year career as a corporate manager, entrepreneur, and higher education administrator here. And I felt that my experience led itself to being part of the Business Advisory Board. I have a particular passion for small business and entrepreneurship. It's the backbone of our economic development structure in the state. And I'd like the opportunity to learn and collaborate and partner with the rest of the board members in making sure that that infrastructure is in place for future business owners, for current business owners to grow and sustain, and to look at what Salt Lake City as a business community is today, five years from now, and ten years from now. Thank you, Karen. Susan? How about if I just say ditto? No. <laughs> um, my name is Sue Rice, and I am a, um, I'm not as, as adventurous as Karen, but I'm a former business owner and uh, over a 30-year resident of Salt Lake City. And as a former business owner and uh, entrepreneur, I, I bootstrapped my own business out of the back room of my house and built that over 10 years into a multi-million national company. And so with that, that has allowed me to, with that experience, to develop a knowledge base and experience that I would really enjoy the opportunity to share with the businesses of Salt Lake City and um, help them achieve their growth and success. I, um, much like Karen, I've been in, uh, retired now for four years and I'm at a point where I'm ready to give back and to help and nothing really thrills me more. And the other thing that is very exciting to me and what really grabbed my interest in this board was to um, see how the, the uh, elevation of the economic development department to the cabinet um, level and that I want to be a part of that. I want to jump on this trajectory and build on what Salt Lake City has done over the, the last um, years and, and it's just really we have such a um, such a global and I, and I have a uh, first hand experience a, a global um, reputation and so like I was a couple of weeks ago I was in Europe and I was flying from Zurich to Amsterdam and I just looked at um, I was on KLM Airlines and one of their uh, 
uh, air, uh, airplane magazines and halfway through I opened it up and there's a two page ad of Salt Lake City and I just got the biggest smile on my face. I felt so proud and I thought I want to be a part of that and so that's one of the reasons what has um, brought me here today and, and be willing to share and, and help the city grow and, and um, working with people like Karen Gunn would be very exciting. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Mayor, do you have anything to add? Welcome. Well, yes, thank you. Uh, so clearly you can see both of these women um, come with a great deal of knowledge and experience and, and a, uh, a huge commitment to really serve our city at a time that I think is critical for us. Um, Sue herself was involved in the process of helping us uh, whittle down the 150 applicants for the executive director role uh, for the Department of Economic Development and as you can see we landed on solid ground so um, I'm very enthusiastic about their desire to serve and I um, hope that you are as well so thank you. Thank you council members do you have any questions or comments? That's a good sign. Um, <laughs> I actually, I have a question. Yes, Derek. Sue, can you tell me about your business? What was? Um, my business was a um, environmental cleanup business. I did really, uh, I would say, 80% of my um, business was uh, federal government work with the EPA, uh, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, helping cleaning up old Cold War sites, and also a uh, number of customers that were Fortune 500 um, companies throughout the country. Fun. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so, so uh, Can I yeah, add something please. to that? So the beauty of that is that that huge background that comes with working with the federal government to mm -hmm. draw down funds and obtain contracts for mm -hmm. small business owners here and I think that also adds a nice element for us. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you both so much for your willingness to serve. I li I'm fond of saying be careful what you wish for because uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll actually have a really good time. This is a good uh, advisory group. So you, we have you scheduled on our consent agenda for later this evening. You do not need to be there. Um, and we look forward to your service with the city. Thank right. you both, both very thank much. Thank you so much thank for you the council. opportunity. Appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, two appointments are for the Police Civilian Review Board. We have Rebecca Myers and we also have Catalina Cardona. Thank you both for being here in the same sort of routine if you uh, act like a rock star and um, uh, quickly give us an introduction and tell us a little bit about your interest in serving on this board. Sure. Would you like to start? Um, sure. Um, pull, pull your microphone really close. <laughs> My name is Catalina Cardona and I have been here in Salt Lake for 15 months now and I decided to settle and with my interest with the civilian review board is I really believe a lot in accountability and also standing, in, standing up for justice whether it be for a civilian who's um, wrongly treated or a police officer who needed to be abdicated. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rebecca Myers and um, I was born in Ogden, Utah and went to school here in Utah and then I went to law school back east and I've lived in a variety of metropolitan areas, um, DC, LA, New York and I have finally decided to settle in Utah. I'm back, I've purchased a house in Central City and I'm very, very much enjoying Salt Lake. I, I, I'm very happy here and I intend to stay here. So now that I'm here, I feel that I have an obligation to participate in my community. Um, I've had a very busy life <laughs> and this is the first opportunity I've had to do it. Um, this particular committee piqued my interest because I'm an attorney for the federal government. I have been for 13 years with a brief stint out in uh, the private sector. Um, I litigate now for the federal government. and. Um, living in the places that I have, I've seen firsthand that it's really very important for the public to view the police as of us as opposed to separate from us. And so if I can do something to help sort of foster that trust, then uh, that's what I'd like to do. So that's my interest. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments, council members? I 
I would just like to thank both of you so much for doing this. This is one of the toughest boards I think we have to serve on because you come under a lot of criticism because people don't understand how fair and balanced and how hard you work. And I have seen remarkable work by our Police Civilian Review Board and I just really appreciate your willingness to serve there and I hope you'll find it satisfying. So thank you for being willing to do it. Thank you both very much. The same thing goes. You are on our consent agenda for this evening. You do not need to attend. And we truly appreciate your willingness to serve um, on these boards with Salt Lake City. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, our next appointment is for the Community Development and Capital Improvement Programs Advisory Board, Jade Sarver. Jade, if there you are. Uh, Jade, uh, could you quickly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your interest on this board? I'll start as my, uh, with my rock star background, being close to the microphone. <laughs> um, my name is Jade Sarver. I have met all of you except for Lisa. So Lisa, it's nice to meet you formally or informally. Um, so um, I, we've, we've all met based off of my experience in the community, but a lot of you don't know about my professional background. So I'll start with that. Um, I have over 15 years of project management experience and most of that was working for Morgan Stanley as a vice president of global training and communications. So uh, I started my career actually as a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley and I was part of a team that managed over $2 billion in assets. So I worked with clients who trusted me to make important decisions with their own money. Um, after working at Morgan Stanley, I moved into consulting and I've been working as a project manager at a design firm here in Salt Lake where I manage multi million dollar projects on a global scale for uh, doing training and communications for big companies. So um, you've seen me working over the last few years with the Fair Park Community Council as a board member and treasurer and I've also joined the board of the Salt Lake Community Network. So um, I'm very honored to be considered for the CIP board and I recognize that this is a really tough board as well. Not, maybe not as tough as the Civilian Review Board, but um, I recognize that there are some pretty significant budget decisions that have to be made here, so um, I would be very honored to be considered. Jane, I tell you, this is really tough because there's never enough money. Right. So, uh, Any questions for Jade? Comments? No, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for your time. You heard the routine about consent agenda, so yes, we sure appreciate your willingness to serve on this very important board, and thank you. Thanks. Our next two appointments, uh, Christian uh, Kesselring and Jason Wessel, and they're for the Human Rights Commission. And we have, a, a, will that microphone work for you? Because we have a portable too if you need fine. one. Okay, great. So Rockstar, you know the routine. Rockstar, introduce yourselves. Tell us why you're interested in this board appointment. Sure. So uh, my name is Christian Kesselring. I'm an attorney here in Salt Lake. And uh, I returned to Salt Lake five years ago to start my practice here. I've, I have been a solo practitioner now, part of a, a small firm here. Uh, before that, I had a, a career in IT and had the crazy idea to go and, uh, out to DC and go to law school. Had a great experience out there and came back here convinced that, that I wanted to work on civil rights issues, specifically civil rights and employment. So uh, a, a large part of my practice has been devoted to, uh, to employment work, discrimination in employment, sexual harassment, so on and so forth. Um, on, and so I have that background to draw on as well as the legal background. I know that this, uh, this commission does, uh, does make policy recommendations to the, the council and so I'd be interested in being involved with that. Uh, from a personal point of view, I, I believe very strongly in the, in the mission of the commission uh, because uh, I have come over, over my, uh, uh, so far, <laughs> my, my so far interesting uh, experiences 
to the belief that, uh, that everyone has the right to be treated equally to everyone else, that the divisions that we convince ourselves are so important are in fact just manufactured and really draw attention away from the value and the dignity of the individual. And uh, I've just been really pleased to live in a city that, uh, that works so hard to assure the rights, and you know, even here in Utah, of people in oppressed groups. And I'm, I'm uh, really happy to be considered for the appointment to this commission. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Okay, my name is Jason Wessel. I think I know most of you, so um, that should be um, easy. Um, I uh, came back to Salt Lake City after working at the State Department um, to start a PhD program in the, the Middle East Center at the University of Utah, and I'm about to defend my dissertation. My uh, research focus was on the Arab Spring, so my headspace for about the last five years has been uh, grassroots social movements, um, democratic claim making, how, uh, how groups of people come together, form coalitions to demand rights. Uh, uh, so human rights, civil liberties has been uh, basically uh, swir swirling around in my head for the last several years. I would really like to be able to look at um, locally how that gets applied on a municipal level and see how we join together and work, work together on um, some of the same issues. Um, outside of the theoretical space, um, practical, uh, practical side of things, um, over the years there have been lots of instances where uh, I think having somebody like me um, involved with these issues could have been um, effective. Um, for the sake of brevity, I can give one example. Uh, when the um, Twilight Concert Series uh, moved from uh, Gallivan Center to uh, Pioneer Park, uh, me and a uh, bunch of uh, people from my uh, murder ball team used to meet up every Thursday and attend those. When it moved to Pioneer Park, um, the ADA section was essentially just the concrete pad around the flagpole. Um, if anybody's attended the Twilight Concert Series, by the time you get to the headlining act, that area is dwarfed by people standing uh, we ended up having people trip over us, having drinks spilled on us, um, have a scar on the inside of my arm from a cigarette or a joint or something getting rubbed up against my arm from somebody trying to keep it down low. Um, I brought it up with the mayor at a community council meeting. Several of the people on my team uh, wrote emails to uh, the organizers and nothing happened all season long. We stopped attending um, because it just got too dangerous to try to be there. Uh, now I know that they put up a barrier that uh, separates the ADA section from the rest of the crowd, but it would have been a quick fix if you had somebody available to just say, you know, a little roped off area right in front of the VIP section would solve this problem. So anyway, I don't want to sound like I'm complaining, but that was a situation that happened a few years ago where, you know, it would have been really convenient to have somebody like me available to, uh, to navigate the situation. Uh, help avoid something that could have ended up uh, in you know, a lawsuit or somebody getting injured. So anyway, uh, thanks for the consideration, and I don't want to take any more of the time up. Thank you, Jason. Any comments or questions? Jason and Christian, uh, thank you very much for your willingness to serve on this really important commission with the city. Um, you are on the consent agenda. You don't need to stay. Um, I'm pretty sure it'll go well. Um, and uh, someone will be in touch with you after this evening to talk about next steps. Thank you, Thank you very Thanks, much Dan. for your time. We're going to go back um, in our agenda to uh, item number two. It's a rezone for 1932 North, 2200 West. Um, I think Nick is, and uh, Nick and Nick. It's a Nick and Nick show. It's a Nick show. So quickly, guys. Did you coordinate outfits? <laughs> <laughs> we secretly do that. Do you do it every day or just for uh, no, just, Tuesdays? Just when we have to sit here. Okay. Just when we want to be Tuesday harassed evenings. by the full council. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to pull up the map here. So maybe while Nick's doing that, I can just give a quick overview of what this is. That'd be this perfect. is a, a proposal to rezone a fairly sizable piece of land on 2200 West um, from one of the AG zones to BP. Um, this is consistent with what's been going on, particularly south of um, 
2200 North where the uh, overpass um, on an off ramp on 215 is um, and so it's supported by the master plans and, and so here we are then is this a uh, petitioner initiated this is this is a private a, a private proposal from from an applicant thanks anything to add Nick the applicant is here if you have questions for him um, do we have any questions thoughts concerns uh, well, to no, yes, Andrew. Is there any uh, opposition to this at all? You know, there really hasn't been. I think there was initially some concern from, so this property is a little bit unique in that it, on three sides, it would extend around an existing uh, residential property that's owned agriculture. Um, but over, as we've talked to those people and moved forward, I think all of those issues have been resolved. And, and to my knowledge, there's no outstanding concerns. And uh, the schedule is that we're sending uh, tonight uh, in consent the public hearing for our July 12th meeting. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Great. Thank you awesome. both very okay. much. Thank Thanks. you. Um, our next uh, item is Yellcrest Harbor Heights Local Historic District. <laughs> Good evening, and Welcome, out of everyone. respect to your time, um, I have a presentation, but I, if you would like, I can just answer questions on this. I know Why the applicant you, would like to address Give us a really you. quick overview, and then we'll just go straight to questions. This um, proposal contains 42 parcels. Uh, of the 42 parcels, there are 39 structures. There's one parcel that is owned by the city. Uh, essentially, it's um, open, open space within um, the streetscape. And then there are two related parcels in this in this area. Uh, Planning Commission and Historic Landmarks Commission did recommend um, adoption of the local historic district. And as you know, following those public hearings and recommendations, we conducted a ballot. Uh, the ballot responses did meet the amended state law, the requirements to um, that two thirds of the return ballots needed to vote in favor. And then at least half of the return ballots uh, of all parcels uh, needed to um, support the proposal, which both of those standards were met in the ballot returns that were documented in your reports. Okay, and uh, we're looking at uh, sending a public hearing for Tuesday, July 12th as the next step, and that's in our consent agenda this evening. Any questions? Looks like we're good. Thank you very much. Thank you. What you look surprised? Like, <laughs> well, I, well, you got you got your votes. Uh, we we do the applicant applicant is here. Um, if there's any questions for them, but it sounds like there may not be. So I think we're good. Okay. I would encourage them to make sure they show up for the public hear hearing okay. with Perfect. lots of neighbors. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have a mini announcement? Okay, we have a quick announcement, and that wow, I can't believe we're on time. So, so uh, on time. this is this is a brief announcement. So, Mr. Chair, with your uh, uh, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to read it whole. Uh, Councilmember Derek Kitchen would like to initiate a legislative action re requesting that the administration review and make recommendations for amendments pertaining to the development in the transit station area zoning district. Uh, concerns have been raised that the existing TSA standards are not meeting the stated purpose of the district. The intent of the legislative action would be to identify and incorporate potential changes. If the council is supportive of this request, a vote will be taken during the formal meeting to initiate the petition. The question is, do council members support this request? Any questions, council members? Yeah. Can Eric? I speak to this just briefly? Sure. And uh, if we could invite Mike Reberg up to the desk. Um, and while he's, up, while he's on his way up, I just want to say that um, this is a result of some community frustration in District 4 that I've uh, co been communicating with some of my residents on, some of our residents on. Um, there's some concern that the TSA zone along 4th South is producing a development pattern and quality of structure that isn't uh, desired 
Um, we're not getting not, not only the quality of materials that we would like to see for something that will be around for 50 plus years, but we're not getting the street level um, engagement that we would like to see on such a busy corridor, um, and we're getting no affordability um, among other smaller concerns. And so I uh, approached um, several of you a couple weeks ago to initiate a petition to have the planning department look at that uh, at this. Um, turns out planning has been looking at this already and had come up with a few um, I, uh, thoughts on how to maybe improve the TSA zone and we're in the mid they were maybe about a third of the way through the process of changing that. Um, so instead of doing something a little more heavy handed we just thought we would uh, coordinate with the administration with this uh, legislative action and so would you mind speaking to uh, what the administration is going to be doing and about your timeline? Sure, absolutely. And, and Nick Norris is joining us in case you have specific questions about the details of the work they're doing. But yes, we concur with um, what Councilman Kitchen is seeking here. Uh, we began some time ago. We realized that the that the the current zone was not meeting the needs and and the desires and the intent of what we were, wanted to have happen. And the planning division has been working on that. And as Councilman Kitchen said, we we're perhaps a third of the way through. So this has been a priority project. Um, and we will continue to make it so and we'll work on this as fast as possible to get the, an ordinance revision done. So do we have any uh, questions, council members? Yes, Andrew. So what does this entail then as of right now or tonight? What changes? Uh, Derek, uh, well, it doesn't actually recommend any changes. It recommends a review of the process with the exception of uh, moving forward allowing commercial activation on the first floor. Is that my understanding? Nick? Nick? Nick, one of the Nicks? <laughs> um, so I think this is in your in your packet of information, but in April, we put together a, a memo for our planning commission that outlined some of the issues we had heard and uh, have identified with the TSA zone. And, and in those, there's a number of things that we will look at. Um, I think there's nine different things, and it, some of them are relatively minor and cleanup types of things. Other things are looking at uh, shoring up some standards that aren't uh, providing what we thought the zone would. Um, and uh, part of that is looking at the approval process and making sure that it's working and adjusted to kind of the market demands that are out there and, and what the market is providing. And part so, of that is looking at our point system for right. how we approve these projects because of, uh, what's happening is that um, because of how we've configured our points, people are able to move forward without doing some of the things we really wanted to see happen in this zone. And so it might be a reconfiguration of how we score projects as well. But all of that's included in part of the evaluation. Right. Does that answer your question, Andrew? Yeah, I just want to make sure we're clear about we are supporting the review that's already ongoing and we'll have some changes. but. I just had a meeting yesterday about the fact that on to go west, we had a big issue with it doesn't carve anything out for private residences. And so um, somebody who's trying to build a house infill in a TSA zone is under the same obligations as a commercial building, hmm. um, which makes it cost prohibitive and a problem at a lot of levels. And so uh, we're probably looking at that already, but it's another yeah. big issue we're running into. Yeah, right now we're looking at, um, because single family homes and, and two family homes and three family homes are allowed in most parts of the TSA zone. And so one of the things we're looking at because of the scale of those things is actually exempting them from that, that same approval process so that it is something that they don't have to meet that same threshold that, you know, a 400 unit apartment building would. Any additional questions? So this is on our agenda for action uh, item uh, this evening. Um, so that will be our opportunity to address it. Thank you, gentlemen, uh, for your briefing. Uh, that concludes our uh, business in our briefing session. Um, dinner is available in the break room. And uh, we need to reconvene across the hall uh, promptly at 7, uh, because I think there's a lot of expectation around the budget this evening. So expect to have uh, certainly press 
available for us. And thank you, uh, council members, for your um, speediness in helping us get through this uh, agenda this evening. Thank you.